The book of Luke chapter number 2, verse uh, 49. And he said to them, he, Jesus, said to them, Why do you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? Check out what Jesus says. He said, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I want to put a tag on this text and teach from this topic. Look at the person to your left and to your right. Just tell them it's business as usual. Just tell them you may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. It's business as usual. So this past week in preparation for today's conversation, uh, family, I ran across a quote that was penned by a former NFL player by the name of Reggie Rivers. He said this quote, and I thought that it was so important. He said this. He said, if you want to focus, if you want to achieve your goals, don't focus on them. He said, if you want to achieve your goals, don't focus on them. This runs counter Contrary and countercultural to many of the convictions that many of us hold. I mean, let's be honest. If uh, we've always heard to focus on your goals, he's saying that if you want to achieve your goals, then don't focus on them. What's going on? I started thinking about that, and that quote arrested me intellectually. It captured me cognitively. That quote was interesting because, um, in essence, he's saying that there's something important that we can gain and we can gather, that we can get from not just focusing on the goal itself, but focusing on something else. So if I were to rephrase, uh, and rephrase that quote and uh, kind of put it in the Foster International version, it, it kind of would say something like this. When we overemphasize the goal, we de-emphasize the gains. When we overemphasize the goal, we de-emphasize the gains. What I'm saying is when we are, when, when all I'm concerned about is the end, I have difficulty celebrating my present wins. It's difficult because your present day wins oftentimes don't, uh, they contribute to your future end. But in order for me to see the fulfillment, stay with me, I'm going somewhere, of a future win, I have to learn to celebrate the present day wins that I have. It's the small gains that lead to a large goal. So, 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 so the goal is not just to be focused on the goal. The goal is to be focused on the gains that get us to the goal. Gain, gains are short-term wins that define and develop us. If y'all stay with me, we're going to go somewhere. Gains. And goals are, goal, a goal is a destination uh, reached because of our commitment to those gains. A goal is a destination to be reached uh, based on our commitment to those gains. So then I've got to develop, watch this, the behaviors of the people that are committed to the gains. <laughs> Nick Saban, I don't like him, but he says something that's good. I'm a Florida State fan. I'm in recovery right now. Y'all pray for me. Nick Saban says something I thought was absolutely amazing. He says, what I teach my team, one of the greatest college football coaches ever, say what I want, most winningest, is that a word? The most winning college football coach ever. He says, what I teach my team is not to be obsessed with the uh, win. Don't be obsessed with the result, he says. He says, I teach my team to be obsessed with the execution of every day. He says, don't focus on winning Focus on executing. Because if you execute in the small gains, you will reach the goal. See, we get distracted because we only focus on the goal. Let me get back to my sermon. The goal is pretty. The gain sometimes feels painful. The goal is the public celebration and the gain is the private dedication. The goal uh, look beautiful, but sometimes the gains look boring. We want the goal, but we don't want to do what it takes to get the gains. 
But, but I've learned that everything, watch this, everything that glitters, y'all ain't saying nothing, ain't, mm -hmm, is not, let me do my perfect English, is not gold. And in a season that I'm in right now, I'm not, watch this, I'm not desiring anybody else's goals. Mm. I'm not mad at nobody. I, I, they can have their relationship goals. They can have their career goals. They can purchase whatever they want. They can have their professional goals. But I'm in a space, I don't know about you, but I'm in a space where I am who I am, and I'm glad who I am. I'm glad about who God has called me to become because I'm seeing gains even though I haven't gotten to my goal yet. I'll tell you why. Last year, I was a different person. Last year, I would have said something slick back. Last year, I would have cursed and cut you. Last year, I would have held unforgiveness in my heart. La Did I come get you yet? Last year, I would have gone back to my old ways. I'm coming down your road. Last year, I would have turned my head to what I knew was wrong. Last year, I would have been complaining more than praying. Last year, I would have been imprisoned by offense. Oh, but this year, this year I'm praying more. This year I'm fasting more. This year I'm reading more. This year I'm forgiving. Is there anybody that can say, I'm seeing small wins? That's, I, I'm, I'm seeing small small wins and I've learned I've learned I've learned Lord have mercy I'm trying to teach today but I've learned that maturity says to thank God for the discipline that you do have to attain the small wins the Bible says this y'all need Bible y'all like pastor what you talking about H Hebrews 12 and 11 says this no discipline seems pleasant at the time some of y'all, this is the only reason y'all came to church. This is your word right here. No discipline, none of them, seemed pleasant at the time, but rather painful. Later on, however, what does it do? It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Keep that right here. Lord have mercy. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but if you hang on to what's unpleasant at the time, you will eventually reach something called purpose in the future. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes, some seasons will not be pretty, but they'll be purposeful. There's going to be some seasons in your life that you won't enjoy, you won't endure. You will feel like you can't endure it. You will feel like you're going to lose your everlasting mind, but you've got to be able to endure what you don't enjoy. There are seasons. He says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Well, my beach, my beach body workout, uh, fresh group. Where y'all at the fresh group? They're at the gym. They're at the, the beach on Saturday mornings. And um, while it looks beautiful out there, I'm sure, and uh, while the sun is rising and it's beautiful and the, the winds are blowing and the water is everywhere, it's a beautiful scene. Uh, but once you get into that workout a little bit, <laughs> it don't seem pleasant at the time. <laughs> It, 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 when you, somebody said burpees when you're down and you're doing those exercises at this beautiful beach in, in beautiful South Florida with the beautiful weather at the time it doesn't seem very beautiful yeah. Yeah. until you mess around and walk by a mirror Watch out. you start you start you say well okay <laughs> all right you start. Anybody like me did one sit up and start looking for a crunch. I mean, a bab. You're like, I know I should see. Ate one salad. I'm like, listen, I should see something. But the thing is, when you do that and you stay committed to small gains, maybe it's not the beach. Maybe it's walking every day. Maybe it's more than uh, a, a salad. Maybe something else. But the goal, the goal is when you stay committed to small gains, then you will see a future end. Yeah. When no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it produces. So the question we have to wrestle with in our minds is do I want to produce? 
Do, do I want to produce? Do I want to be on earth just to exist or am I on earth to produce? <sighs> okay. Y'all, y'all looking at me strange. Okay. Let me get to the Bible then. Oh, I'm doing good on time. Let me get to the Bible. Uh, by the time of our text, Jesus, uh, there's, there's some powerful lessons because we, we, we not only see the gains, we, we only see the gains when we create the behaviors that get us to the goal. So Jesus in our text, at this tender young age of 12, is exemplifying behaviors uh, in the present that helps us see a future goal. Check, check this out. Check this out. Check this out. This, let me give you a little context uh, so that you can respect the content. In, in, in Luke chapter number two, it is uh, the time of Passover. So Mary, Jesus' mother, Jesus uh, and Joseph have gathered with the rest of the town to go to a feast called Passover. Y'all say Passover. It's extremely important. Uh, they gather to go to Passover. 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 What is Passover? Great question. Passover is a festival whereby uh, the Jewish people commemorate, remember, and even celebrate uh, the, the, in, the example or the, the time in which they came out of bondage and God released the death angel and he told them, watch this, watch what God told them. He told them, put the blood over your doorpost and when that death angel sees the blood over your doorpost, the death angel will pass over your house. Right? This is important. So they say, uh, uh, so God gave them instructions, take the blood of an unblemished lamb, put it on the doorpost. And whenever the death angel sees the blood, the, he has to pass over. Hmm. I'm going to come back and get you. Put the blood over the doorpost. And whenever uh, injury, harm, death sees the blood, he's got to pass over. All right? So that's extremely important. So what they would do is they would literally all get in one huge caravan. So it's not two people going out of town. It's, it's not one or three people traveling by themselves. It's literally hundreds, if not thousands of people. They gather the things that they have. They get on camels, donkeys, everything that they have. Some people walk and they would all track. This is important. They would all travel uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This is extremely important. So so here it is. Uh, uh, so, so what ends up happening is while they're doing that, they end up, watch this, losing Jesus. Okay. <laughs> they end up losing Jesus. They celebrate the Passover. They get up. Everybody gathers their things. Mary gathers her things. Joseph gathers his things. They head back home. They're traveling for days out. And Mary says, where Jesus? Because that's not, that's not necessarily strange because typically in this type of situation, it's very possible for Jesus to have been with another set of travelers. So, you know, back in the day, we used to go outside. How many people remember you can go outside when you, you were able to travel to the park and go places? Um, I, I, that's important because nowadays kids can't even go outside. Not because they don't want to. Some don't want to. But be honest, if you're a parent or auntie or a niece or something, you don't even want them to. Let's, these people are crazy. You don't know what's going on, right? But this wasn't that. <laughs> this is in a time where it's nothing, it takes a village, it's nothing for somebody to be with somebody else's family. So Mary's traveling thinking, oh, he must be with Joseph with the other family. Joseph is traveling thinking he must be with Mary with the other family. They get to where they're going and they realize we done lost Jesus. Now, now, watch this. How here they are leaving service, leaving a worship experience, had a good time. No Jesus. <laughs> Dancing, shouting, no Jesus. Friends, good time, good food. Community, no Jesus. All right, let me get back to the text. <laughs> the, the, the first thing I see in the text, y'all all right tonight, today, this morning, wherever it is? <laughs> the first thing I see in the text is Jesus' location. 
<laughs> Let's get to work. Jesus' location, verse number 45 says this. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Um, now so, it was that after three days, that's important, after three days, <clears throat> they found him in the temple. Mm -hmm. they, after three days, they found him in the temple. Jesus' location. Three days, his parents were looking for Jesus. They, they head back to Jerusalem, and then they say, go check the temple. Uh -huh. So Jesus, watch this, Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Great class. Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, at this young age, they were looking for him, and they found him in church. I need you to see something. I need you to see something. Okay, all right. Jesus thought that being in the temple was so important that he would rather disappoint some people to be there. Jesus Christ. He didn't see church as a chore. He saw it as a chance. Oh, God. He didn't see church as a chore. Y'all hear? He saw it as a chore. He saw, watch this. He saw, how do you see church? How do, how do you see it? How do you see it? Just something to do? Um, just something to do? Something to make you feel better about today? Um, how do you see church? Is church a chore? What, what has to happen to get us to gather? Do we only gather when life's a wreck. See, see, what ends up happening is we'll end up, not y'all, but just people in the world. What ends up happening is if it takes storms to get us in the seat, God says, I love you so much, I'll keep you in the storm. <laughs> he said, I love you so much that I'll keep you in the storm. Because I need to keep you in the seat. Some people pray better when we're going through. Wow. And we're like, God, deliver us. And God says, no, I don't want to deliver you because I like you better when you're like that. You pray more when you're going through. You fast more when you're going through. It's quiet. It's not a chore. It's a chance. It's a chance to grow spiritually. Can I get an amen right there? It's a chance to grow in a deeper relationship with God. It's a chance to grow in our person-to-person -person relationships. It's our chance to grow in biblical literacy. When life starts life and I can't lean on life, I've got to lean on my Lord. Is there anybody in here that can say, I need my church? <laughs> oh, Jesus is, okay, Jesus' location speaks to Jesus' affection. This is Jesus. Y'all say Jesus. Jesus does not, Jesus does not have to go to church. Jesus don't need a word. <laughs> Just trip on that. <laughs> trip on the fact that Jesus does not need a word. <laughs> he is the word, right? Yeah. So, so he's born of a virgin. He don't need to go to church. Um, the prophets spoke of him hundred year, hundreds of years before his arrival. Yeah. Um, he does not have to be in church. But what he's showing us is a principle called, it's a principle of stewardship. Because stewardship is not just about our resources. Stewardship is about our presence. <sighs> Some environments don't deserve your presence. Are y'all here? <laughs> uh, all right. Because where we, sh okay. Okay, an environment can either enhance or entrap you. So Jesus at the tender age of 12 shows us that our location can determine our elevation. The course and the quality of our lives will be determined not only who we are, but where we are. Provision is oftentimes tied to a place. And we live in a culture, y'all, I hope y'all can just roll with me. We live in a culture who sees everything as important, except the things Jesus saw as important. <laughs> every, every, everything, everything is important except what Jesus said is important. <laughs> Jesus didn't see the church as an option or an obligation. He saw it as an opportunity. 
He saw it as an opportunity. Watch this. He chose, um, Lord have mercy. He chose disappointing some people that he loved to be where he needed to be. He chose, he, it's, it's, it's this idea, I got to walk through this, it's this idea of, of, of denying the cultural idea of convenience. Culturally, we oftentimes only do what's convenient. And this is the most unpopular message ever. This is going to get two shares on YouTube, y'all. Watch. That's okay. We only do what's convenient. If it's convenient, then I'll do it. And Christ comes to kill convenience. Everything about following Christ is inconvenient. Deny yourself. I don't feel like doing that. Pick up your cross. I don't feel like doing that. And follow me. Right? So, so we want, not y'all, not y'all, I'm just in general. Um, we want an entree of sin in the side of the Savior. An entree of sin. You ever been to a restaurant? Yes, you have. Recently, we went to... Uh, where's that restaurant we went to? We haven't been there years. Olive Garden. We haven't been to Olive Garden in at least 12 years. So I don't know what happened. We just ended up going to Olive Garden. And then they brought the, the meal. I got, you know, some chicken parm and this, that, third. Y'all are like, Pastor, you always talking about food. Yes, I love it. Hallelujah. Anyway, they brought the meal out. And uh, this, then the waiter, she comes back with the little cheese thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Listen. Listen. <laughs> She's like, you want me to, you know, hit it with a little, okay. I'm like, absolutely, have your way. <laughs> so, so she's, you know what I mean, she's not, and the cheese stuff going on, on the meal. I got my meal there, my chicken parm, and the boom, she, she's like, that's enough. Ah, hit me some more. So, you know, she hit me with the cheese, and I'm loving it. That's how we want Jesus. We want our convenience, sprinkle a little cheese, a little Jesus on it. We don't want him to be the actual meal. We just want him to be the sprinkling on top. We don't want to have our lives completely for him. We just want to sprinkle a little Jesus on my own way. Sprinkle a little Jesus on my own plans. Sprinkle a little Jesus on my own. We, we want ranch dressing Jesus. A little bit on the side just in case life gets a little too I can dip a no, man. when life gets a little spicy I can dip a little ranch Jesus I don't want too much just a little bit when Jesus's location is he was in the church we don't know if it was raining we don't know if, if it wasn't good weather for him. Maybe it was great weather. In most places, people don't come to church when weather is uh, good. I'm sorry, bad. In South Florida, we don't come to church when weather good. <laughs> I ain't mad. <laughs> we like, man, it's looking too good out here. I'm going to the beach. <laughs> I'm going to brunch. I'm going to catch it online. <laughs> I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm just telling you the reality of the situation. We want a little bit of Jesus, not enough to cover the whole entree of my life. Because I don't know if I trust him for all that. I don't know if I trust him to lead my whole life. Let me lead some, then I'll let you lead Sundays. Perfect. His location, Jesus' location. We, we ranch dressing Jesus. Somebody put that online right now. They ain't going to know what you're talking about. <laughs> put it right on social media. Just hashtag ranch dressing Jesus. Um, Jesus wants us to see church as gathering at the temple is an opportunity to give us to, an opportunity, an opportunity to give a worship offering, a seed offering, and a serve offering. This is a pastoral message right here. A worship offering, a seed offering, and a serve offering. Worship offering, that's us lifting our hands unto God. What we just did during worship. That's why God shows up. God shows up in a temple not for a word. He is the word. He shows up for worship. So when you miss worship, you miss the part that's about God. When I make a habit of missing worship, I say, you know what? 
All the stuff in service that's about God, I don't care about. I'm just here for me. That's what we say. Because God don't need a word. So when I say, oh, they probably done, oh, they probably get done that praise words about 12, 10, 20. All right, I get there about 10. Ah, pastor, get up. Then I get me a word, boom, 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 and then boom. God like, ooh, but what about me, though? Jesus, I'm still in Jesus' location. He was in the temple. He didn't have to be. He didn't need to be. He thought it was beneficial to be. He was, he's not only our Lord, he's, our, he's not only our Savior, he's our example. If he saw fit to be in the temple. Ah, Jesus. So, 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 so not only do I see, are y'all all right? Everybody good? Praise God. Then not only do I see Jesus' location, number two, I see Jesus' submission. Now, verse number 46, now, so it was that after three days, they found him, watch this, I'm getting ready to lose the whole church, this is going to be, a, watch this, okay, they, they found him in the temple, okay, we just read that, sitting in the midst of the teachers, okay, that makes sense, both listening, all right, stop, <laughs> they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening, why Siri, what? Siri trying to go off. Lord, okay. <laughs> they found him in the temple listening. Let's look at Jesus' submission. Jesus didn't have to listen. Who, what were they going to teach him? Think about it. What, what were they going to teach Jesus? <laughs> Jesus' submission means he... he he, watch this, here goes a bad, here goes a curse word in 2024. I'm getting ready to curse in church. Jesus' submission shows us in verse number 46 that he listened to somebody. I just cursed, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, forgive me, please. He didn't pretend to know it all. He listened. He sat down. And listen, some of our problem is we don't listen. We don't, li I should write a book called The Art of Listening. Listen, I'm trying to help you. Listen, listen. God says, I'm sending you signs, wonders, people, sermons, podcasts, conferences, concerts, your neighbor, your best friend telling you, and you still won't listen. Okay. In, 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 in the society uh, of podcasts and, and, and talking head videos and vlogs, and we created a monster that can't be tamed. We created millions of avenues for us to talk, for us to express, for us to explain, for us to put out. And God is saying, will you listen, though? Okay, what does the Bible say about listening? I'm glad you asked. Great question. James chapter 1, verse 9. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person, watch this, be quick to hear, <laughs> slow to speak, and slow to anger. Quick to hear. Slow to speak. Culture is quick to speak. Slow to hear. And slow to anger. That means when somebody's telling you something, you should be like, what, what happened? Huh? Whenever there's an opportunity to grow closer to God, to learn something, huh? Oh, I thought you was, okay. All right, I, I received that. What, what is that? Quick to hear. All right, I'll give you more Bible. Proverbs 10 to 17. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. So an inability to hear not only impacts you, it impacts the people that's close to you. The way, okay, Proverbs 12 and 15. <laughs> the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. 
But watch what a wise man does. But a wise man listens to advice. Are y'all here? A wise man listens to advice. That, that means help me. Y'all are saying that. <laughs> help me. I, I, tell me something. Give me some instruction. I, I crave instruction. Immaturity despises instruction. Maturity craves it. When I was a child, I didn't want anybody to tell me what to do. I wanted to do my own thing. I figure it out by myself. I'll do whatever. But when I grow up, when I put away childish things, I say, can you give me one piece of information that'll move me from where I am to where I'm trying to go? Somebody shout, listen. This, this is extremely important. Um, here's why. Here's why. I'm supposed to teach that. Here's why. When we refuse to learn by listening, we will be forced to learn by life. When we refuse to learn by listening, we will be forced to learn by life. We will have to go through unnecessary storms. God, why I keep going through? I didn't even know she was like that. <laughs> I, I never would have thought he would have did. I never would have thought that job would have done this. I never would have thought this, that, and the third. And God says, I've given you 66 books of principles. But will you listen? What if I told, here's the problem. I can't, I got to be nice. I love y'all. Here's the thing. I'll just talk about me. Sometimes in my life, there have been times where I did not listen because I knew what they were going to tell me, and I didn't want to do it. So I figure if I don't listen to it, I won't feel bad about not doing what I know I should do that they're going to tell me. So sometimes I don't want to hear certain scriptures because guess what? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Y'all ain't even going to come back next week, man. I better. <laughs> and God has us here. Um, and for this particular business as usual idea, uh, because he want, there's something he wants us to get. Um, but there's a few of us that can say, you know what? I thank God that I did listen to the advice I did listen to. Amen. Is there anybody that can say, I didn't listen to everything, but there's a few things where I say, whoo, thank God. Yeah. Woo! Anybody have some stuff in their life that you said, God, I thank God that I took a notice of that red flag and I changed immediately. I didn't do everything perfect, but I did listen to some advice and I'm grateful. Would you praise God for the consequences that you didn't get for the... I said praise God that other people got what you should have gotten, but God has been so gracious to you. He listened, and not only did he listen, he asked questions. Verse number 46, he listened and was asking questions. Now, he was asking questions, not seeking information, but dropping revelation. He, he's asking questions, so your growth or lack thereof will be dependent on your ability to ask the right questions. There, there is some information that won't be unlocked because you don't know what question to ask. There are certain rooms that you walk into that you have to know the right question to get what you need out of the room. There are certain conversations. Let's go even practical. So many of us have mentors and, and people that we aspire to be, uh, to you admire what they're doing, whether it be in business and spirituality or, or professional, whatever it is. The question is, do you even have the questions that you want to ask them? What if you've seen them yet tomorrow? What would you say? Oh, man, I just, I love your work. And, um, yeah, so... Um, in, in, my, in my notes, I, I, got, a, I got questions for people that I admire that I know I'm going to meet. I got questions. There are certain questions I need to ask you. I don't want to ask you, uh, just oh, can you sign this? What is that going to do, right? I got questions because there's information that will be unlocked if I ask the right question. There's questions that we need to ask God. 
There's answers we want, but we haven't asked the question. Yeah. Are y'all here? Yeah. All right, let me, one more time. Okay. Um, um, Jesus' submission. <laughs> submission. That means Jesus know, knew who he was, but he still sat up under somebody. Now, we live in a time where nobody wants to be submitted to anything. Because we all are on the same level. You a man just like me. And you've heard preachers, pastors, and priests get up in front of you and say, I'm a man or I'm a woman just like you. Ain't nothing. Don't look at me. These are things that we've heard. Don't look at me as no better than you. I'm just like you. The devil is a lie. Because I don't want no pastor that's just like me. Can I get an amen right there? I'm not saying you need to be perfect. Negro, but you need, <laughs> hello, <laughs> you, I'm sorry, I'm not saying, but you don't need to be doing what I'm doing, hello, you need to have conquered something, I need a testimony, come on somebody, <clears throat> I don't need to be calling you to my pastor, could you pray for me, and you're like, man, shoot, you pray for me, I'm just going, just like you, I'm just going through too, you know what I'm saying, we are, we are, we are not the same. That, that doesn't mean anybody is better or worse. I'm just saying different. There's a different call when you talk about leadership, spiritual leadership. There's a different, watch this, there's even a different punishment. There's a different punishment. So I don't want nobody that's just like me. I need somebody praying more. I need somebody fasting more. I need somebody reading more. I need somebody more submitted. I need somebody forgiving more. So we live in, in culture that says we all the same. I'm like, but you don't, you don't carry that to your job. Right. What do you say? My supervisor. But then you get to church and you say Joey. We get to work and say, yeah, you know, the boss calling a meeting. Then we get here and we say Sonia. Wait, hold on. So there's more weight on the secular than the sacred? I got to go because y'all going to shoot me. <laughs> I love y'all so much. This is so good. Not only Jesus' submission, but lastly, Jesus' declaration. Um, verse, verse number 47 says this, and all who heard this conversation that Jesus was having with the teachers uh, were astonished. His, his understanding, because of his understanding and answers. They're like, yo, what is, where does this 12-year-old get this knowledge from? So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. I can't skip this. Listen to what she says. She says, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why do you look for me? Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Let's look at Jesus' declaration. Mary says, your father and I, referring to Joseph. Jesus answers, my father's business, referring to God. <laughs> His declaration is that I understand that you're disappointed, but I have an assignment. He was clear on his assignment, so when you're clear on your assignment, you're clear regarding who and what's important for it. He said, I must be, I'm, I'm done. You can play. I'm, I must be about my father's business. What is that? My father's business. Here's my father's business. We're talking about us. Our father's business is discipleship, evangelism, outreach, serving, sowing, worshiping, fellowship, praying, fasting. This is business as usual. If we're not careful, we'll get so busy trying to do everything else. This is what the church is. This is what God is calling us to do, us. This is business. This is what we're supposed to be focused on, leaned on, leaned in on. This, this is it. This is it. This is it. This is who we are. As believers, this is our Father's business. Yes, we got other things that we're going to do, of course. We got, we got family and all that stuff, and that, all of that's good. All of that's beautiful. I love all of it. But what I'm saying is, as it relates to what our Father's business is, 
this is what assignment looks like this is what purpose looks like so I want to I want to I want to challenge us to get rid of distractions to lock in to what God is calling you to do you to do and you to do to focus stuff is going to happen inconveniences are going to come but I need you to shake it off and I need you to get back to your father's business he says there's purpose for you there's a plan for you I've called you for such a time as this would you put your hands together in the house guys for that